Good evening, welcome to Essentials TF. Uh, not, I'm not really, sure, not really sure where to go with this, so I'm going to introduce myself. My name's Hildreth, and joining me is Funs, just to uh, say hi Funs first, actually. Hey, what's going on? It's me. Yeah, first, first let's introduce ourselves a little bit to uh, people People watching. They might not um, know who we are. Um, we're 6v6 competitive players, also Highlander competitive players as well. Uh, we both have played in the same team together, although Funz is now playing for a different team called Team Ascent, who we're going to look at today a little bit. I've got maybe like 9 or 10 years of experience in TF2, eight, at least 8 years, actually 9 years of experience in 6v6. And probably about three or four years in Prem. ETF to L Prem, that is. Have fun, so why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, so I've been playing TF2 competitively since around 2014. I think I've been playing Prem for about, must be a year and a half by now. Yeah, year and a half. And as Hildreth said, I played with him in a Prem team for a few seasons before betraying them and going my own way. And I main scout. Oh yeah, I main demo man. I should I should mention that. Yeah, um, yeah, we used to we play together on low panda. We uh, our highlights include Swilan losing to Freya Tech in the final. Um, beating them on one map. Yeah, that that was probably our highlight. Uh, I sixty one coming third at I sixty one Insomnia thirty one and uh, third in season twenty seven together as well. So yeah, that's what we've done. Not. But we're going to be looking at introducing you guys to 6v6 TF2. Um, a lot of people call it competitive TF2 uh, as the only f format in competitive TF2. That's not that's not true. There are other formats, as you've been watching the Ulti Duo Cup on that was on before. But 6v6 is certainly the most uh, popular and um, viable for LAN events and competitive tournaments. And that's why we're here today to talk a bit more about it. The thing about sixes, as you probably well know, is it's quite niche in the way it's run. Uh, there are certain rules and ways it's played that's very different from a casual competitive experience. And that's uh, what we're here today to do is sort of explain some of them. And ways you can get um, things that go on in the scene. And then we're all going to look at in a premiership game from the latest Essentials Monthly Cup that just recently happened. We're going to look at the final between seven. If some of you have been following Rewind Land, you know that they competed at Rewind Land and they came third. Uh, a bit of unlucky food poison incident there, which was unfortunate. And it's by the burrito. Yep. <laughs> and, they, and they are playing Funz's team, Team Ascent, in the final. So we're going to have a look at that as well and talk about some of the strategies and goings on and how the general meta game works in 6v6. So if you're still awake, let's uh, let's talk about 6v6. So 6v6 obviously is played with um, six players on each team. Now it has some weird class limits. Funds, tell us about the class limits. Yeah, so it's not really following a particular system in any way, but the way it works is a team will generally have two scouts on it, two soldiers, one demo man, one medic. So the scouts are limited to two per team, same with soldiers. But then when you come to demo and medic, you can actually only have one at a time. So these were just general limits that were decided as people sort of formed the meta all those years ago. When sixes was created. And then as well as this, you can optionally have one heavy, one sniper. I think it's two spies at the moment. Um, one pyro or... In some instances, two pyro is essentials as seen recently. Uh, and is there also one engineer then? But yeah, I think that's it for class limits. Pretty much, if yeah. I've missed something. Uh, no, I don't think you have. Um, never used to always be that way, but over time, 6v6 has sort of changed the way leagues have implemented them. Um, for example, there's different. Uh, rules involved which have been constantly evolving a lot of it's a, 
about the whitelist, and there are certain weapons that are banned, certain aren't banned, and there's a global whitelist put in the three major leagues. In TF2, the leagues are ETF2L, UGC, and ESCA, being the three major leagues where people participate in. Um, that's in Europe and North America. There's also leagues around the world in Asia. I think it's still Asia Fortress over there. I could be wrong. And yeah, then Oz so. Fortress yeah. as well. And there's also South American scene, but to be honest, I'm not very familiar with them. So I'm sure you could Google it and look it up. But those are the scenes that exist. But they have all unified to have a, a similar, a, the same whitelist in recent years, but it never used to be that case. I'm not really going to go over the banned weapons. Um, if you have any questions about what's banned or not, uh, please ask in the Twitch chat. We'll, we'll answer some questions at some point during the stream. But what we're what we're gonna do is uh, just just look at the biggest thing that affects the game modes, which other than unlocks, which are maps. And as you know, in TF two, you have in your pub or casual experience, you'll play Payload, King of the Hill, uh, Saxon Hail. But this 6v6 is primarily played on 5 CPs or control point on maps that are and that generally only played on a choice 5 to, I'd probably say 5 to 9 maps throughout all of the TF2 scenes that you would see them. And they, they sort of rotate in and out different seasons. Only one other map from a different game mode exists. That's Viaduct or Product as it's known in competitive circle. Uh, but we won't be talking about it today, we'll be talking about 5CP. And the point of 5CP is it's kind of a tug of war. Um, if you don't know know about the, how the game mode works, it's a tug of war. You have five capture points. Um, you will start with a mid fight, uh, which will be the fight over the central capture point. The winner of that will hold the mid, mid and um, push the fourth point from their perspective. And the loser will be defending their second point teams will win a round when they've captured all five of the control points and then the round will restart. Are you, are you getting all this so far, Thuns? Yeah, yeah, I'm getting this. I'm, I'm following along. I'm glad you are, because I'm, I'm not actually... Uh, there's also different rules rules in terms of um, time limit. On the Typically in Europe, you'll play 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes per map with a win limit of five. It has been win difference of five as well in um, ETF2L. But I think in the cups, we've been using win limit of five rounds. Yeah, which is more similar to what you see in North America, because they have a slightly different format where they'll, in general, play two halves of one map, half an hour each, and then the winner is the first team to reach five, uh, rather than five rounds ahead of the other team. And then the halves get split into when a team reaches three rounds. Cool. I'd love to, by the way, I'd love to be able to display a little bit more um, sort of visual example of what we're talking about. So I apologise if you have to listen to my monotone voice. But it's just how it is. Yeah, just how it is. Yeah, if you have any questions about the rules, now's a good time to start asking. We'll try and answer some of them. But what we are going to do in a minute uh, is we're going to look at Fun's play his class, the scout class in uh, for Team Ascent versus Seven. But before we before we do that, we'll give you guys um, some chance to ask a few questions. Fun's, um, just tell us about your team a little bit, like who's on it, um, where they're from and when, how you formed. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, Ascent was a team that was playing last season that formed off of the top five rocket roster which is a team of French players that's been playing in, around ETF2 for quite a long time, um, has attended various lands. And then um, Ombrek, who is the oldest surviving member of our team, basically put a team together for, I think it was for last season, and ended up coming second overall, losing to Swift in the final. Uh, and then coming into the season, they were looking to make some roster changes. So uh, uh, Elacor stuck on Demoman. Uh, so he's the Demoman, then Ombrek on Medic. They picked up me on scout, while keeping Credu as the odd scout, uh, Finnish scout, and then two new soldiers in Chris 
and Josh, who are both from Ireland. So yeah, that's basically how this team formed. So we're playing off the basis of the what's already been established from last season and seeing if our new players can sort of add something to the team and find success in etf 2 l this season. But yeah, that's how my team formed. Good, good stuff. Um, we won't talk about how you broke um, Mickey's heart, but we'll. Uh, oh, we got a question from Halox. Uh, question about setup. If an NG is building something near spawn, can I also switch to NG and help him? Now that's actually um, something that we were talking about earlier about the class limits funds, you, uh, where NG near is class limit one in six v six, and so you would not be allowed to do that in in 6v6 because you're only allowed to have one engineer active at the same time um if you are playing engineer and and you uh you die but your sentry lives nobody on your team is allowed to go engineer to try and keep it alive and nobody and if you are playing for example scout let's actually let's say sniper you're playing sniper and there's class limit one on sniper and you and you die Nobody is allowed to go sniper until you respawn. Even if you don't respawn a sniper and just respawn a scout or something, nobody else in your team can play sniper. Uh, the reason for this is um, the rules are like this: is people you would see strategies where people would, for example, go medic. Um, when their medic died, somebody else on their team would would just go medic instantly, and then they would constantly have a medic up. Um, it w didn't happen often, but it happened enough for people to uh, to do it. But yeah, you can't do that as engineer Halox. Um, so it's only one engineer allowed at a time, and only he is allowed to build this sentry. Um, y what you will see in game sometimes is you, and you will do this when you play, is you'll have two people spawn the same class, um, which, depending on which config you use, can happen. But only as long as you both. Don't leave spawn. It's okay. You won't get in trouble for doing it. Just make be aware of what your teammates run in. So if you have two people spawn as heavy, just keep um one of you just spawn back as a different class. Don't you both go there? But yeah, I hope that answers your question. If you need anything else asked, please let us know. Yeah, I think that about covers that. I did see another question earlier in chat as well, which was which weapons specifically were banned. And you can just go to, I think the one's been posted in chat now. The global whitelist, which is currently being used, uh, gives a extensive list of all the weapons, all the unlockable weapons, that is, that are banned and that are allowed in play. So you can find it all there. Because of, I'm guessing, a lot of people here are kind of new and um, come from a casual background, we should probably explain why Cookie Cutter has become a thing. Um, just to be, just to be clear, uh, in six v six, the what Cookie Cutter it means is a terminology just meaning basic, you know, standard rollout, standard um, lineup. I'm not sure how the name Cookie Cutter got adopted. Some other nerd can tell you. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't off-class. And off-class is a term that we give to people who, when teams and players run a what's what's not known as the cookie cutter, when they run something different than two soldiers, two scouts, a demo man and a medic. Although you'll never see a team not run a medic in a demo. But putting that aside, um, an example of that will be our previous team fund, Slow Panda. We were very well known for doing it. But there have been other teams in the past as well. Like there was a team that used to run a perma heavy back in the day when I started playing TF2. There's always one. There has to be one to keep the balance. But yeah. But yeah, you're. I mean. Yeah, sorry. I mean, Cookie Cutter itself. I think the classes that most people play are just based off what was generally accepted to be the most effective in most situations. So you can have. I mean, we haven't actually gone through the the roles of the classes themselves in Sixer so far, so I guess we could go through that before explaining why those classes are generally the best, just very briefly. Oh yeah, yeah, go through the roles, please. Yeah, so, so obviously we have the Medic, who's central to the team, controls the team's health, has Uber Charge, and then a lot of the game is based off of that Uber Charge, what Uber Charge the other team has, and that sort of decides what you can do in the game. And then you've got the Demo Man, whose main roles are like high damage output, 
quickly and also to sticky off and stop people from going into certain areas. So areas like that would be the choke points on Gully, for example. A demo may sticky here to stop the other team from coming through or may just hide stickies in places so that when the team does come through, you can get picks and stop their push. So that's the demo. Then we have two soldiers. One of the soldiers plays the pocket soldier role. And this person will generally take a lot of heals, usually the most heals from the medic. And his job is just to put out damage as well as protect the medic from any attackers that may be coming in. That's just a very general sort of wrap up for pocket. And then Roma is the other soldier. Roma has the alternative role of playing on the flank. So away from the enemy medic usually, uh, the friendly medic usually. I mean, just, be just for an flank. example, like, um, oh yeah, sorry, continue. But we'll sort of go through typical positions. Yeah, I was just, just going to say, for example, the combo may be holding in choke. That'll be the medic pocket demo perhaps the roma then may be holding on the flank which in this map is called big door he'll just watch for enemy players that may be trying to get through and make sure that the team can't flank against his team uh yeah just to highlight again so that is the choke um where as he funds was saying that's where typically the combo will be and the flank the combo consisting of the medic demo man pocket and this pocket scout, which we'll go in later in a second. And this is the flank where you'll see the Roma hold with the other scout. But sorry, go ahead, go on, Funds. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, so you'll generally have two people on the flank. That'll be the Roma and then one scout. And then the Roma's other job is basically to find openings when he can and when it's appropriate to try and force the enemy team's Uber or perhaps go for picks that he thinks will be worthwhile. But the main sort of starting role of Aroma is just keep his ground and make sure he doesn't overextend and can keep his team from being attacked from behind. And then finally we move on to two scouts. Um, more historically I suppose the scouts didn't have too different of a role but nowadays most teams or at least a lot of teams lean towards the idea of having one scout who plays the sort of pocket scout role which is similar to the pocket soldier but rather than having the pure sort of focus on keeping the med alive he'll just take a lot of heals and because Scout is a very high damage output class, just take all the heals and try and kill people in fights as the sort of main powerhouse of the team, following up on other people's damage. Yeah, and known as a uh, clean up, but yeah. Yeah, that's called clean up. And then finally, we have the flank Scout, who does do similar to the pocket Scout. We'll try and get in to fights from the back ends when it's appropriate, but probably not taking so much heals, so many heals even, and just generally assisting his Roma on the flank to take fights when he needs to. Yeah, those are the typical roles. I mean, teams will vary them up depending on their strategy. But we got we got a few questions, I guess. We can. Well, I've seen a couple of questions. Uh, Jake Marley said, "What about suiciding to give NG more metal? When would you do that?" Um, you'd never suicide in six v six. You might in Highlander in the pre-round, but not in six v six because you don't play games where there's a setup anymore. You don't play those gamers, you play 5CP and cough. So you would never suicide because you should not be giving your life away at any point in the game. Um, well, teams will give their life away, but they don't give them away to let to give their teammates metal. Generally, yeah, so, And also yeah. generally engineers run in a situation where there's always metal available, i.e. by their spawn door. Yeah, I think the idea of suiciding to give your team metal is usually just from Highlander, where an engineer is going to be setting up his guns in a place where he doesn't have quick access to ammo, so for example on the other side of the map from the spawn, and that's why in the 60 second sort of startup period your team will suicide to give metal. But in sixes, in general, the only people, the only places where people run engineers is going to be on the last to defend against potentially an uber advantage, so there's not actually any need to suicide, as Hildred said because you can so quickly just get into spawn and completely replenish your metal supplies. Uh, it looks like uh, Plunk already, uh, sorry, Jake Marley already uh, got that answered anyway, but uh, also, in you speak London, I, I know you. How you watch Mookie stream? I remember Mook said you got the strat from an OG team sniper, Puta Smith. Yeah, that's uh, on this map, Gully Wash. Um, we, we did run a strat called, um, where we ran sniper heavy. Uh, scout, soldier, demo man, medic, um, basically a pro lander strat, um, and that used to be run back in the day, like in 2010, 2011, 2009 sort of time, 
by a team called TCM, known as Team Cooler Master. I think they were, they were obviously you all know them as uh, providing them. Well, they, what do they provide? Some sort of hard uh, like CPU fans or something? Yeah, I don't, hardware. I don't know. Uh, they do uh, peripherals as well. Yeah, peripherals. Keyboards, mice, but that kind of stuff. They used to sponsor a TF2 team called TCM, and they used, TCM used to run the same strat. Um, we just brought it into the modern age. So there you go. That's the answer to your question. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yeah, there's one from Dom Basek. Which yeah, I've seen it. Uh, so which are the best Roma picks, and how can I recognize when a specific pick is more valuable than another? Okay, so it's actually a pretty in-depth question because it's very situational uh, when you're playing Roma. So there's certain times of the game where it's more worthwhile to go for trades, which is where you're going to get a kill, maybe two, but then probably not escape with your life. Uh, usually that's when you get to what's called a stalemate and neither team is really looking into push. So um, in these situations, you can sort of afford to go for any trade, really, because it's not really going to be too much of a burden on your team if you die and no one else does. And it also opens up possibilities for your team. Uh, in general, a med pick is always, or usually, worth going for. Because unless you're the only player left on your team, and all you need to do is kill one scout to defend. If you can kill the enemy med, the cost of one soldier is not too bad. Because it means your team is going to be playing with uber and heal advantage. But yeah, other than that, um, it's usually not worth to just go solely for soldier picks. Because it's not bringing too much to your team, and you staying alive could be more useful. Demo man could be a decent pick, but it's it's really just situational, and you need yeah. to th you need to think about if your team is gonna miss you if you're dead. If not, then sure. And sometimes the objective of a bomb isn't even to get a pick, but to get a t to distract and just do damage. So it's yeah. it gets it is very in depth. Hopefully we could when we go through the demo later, we can maybe show you a bit more on that. Um, uh, Launch TF about will us will we get in, t in team in team Orlando will you get one mentor to help you uh, I think that's a question for the um, admins so hopefully some moderator will answer that for you Launchy uh, how do I keep my composure as a medic um, that's probably a question that it's uh, probably not appropriate for us to answer because we'll be going into um, specifics of uh, your mentality. Uh, you know, everyone gets nervous playing. Well, I say everyone gets nervous playing games, but I'd say the more experienced you are as a player, the more composure you'll gain over time. But yeah, um, that's that's one of the things you will learn as you get more experience. Yeah. I think that kind of thing just comes from playing the game. Yes, yeah, snap you're not on. Gonna, you're not going to jump into a game and just be able to, uh, like before even trying out the game, be able to be. The best bed, you know, it all comes from practice. I'll, yeah, I'll tell you one thing that will help is having a very good team atmosphere from your other players. So if you have um, a player that's very, that gets very upset when you make mistakes and is shouted at you all the time, it's probably not going to help somebody that lacks composure. It might help a certain type of player um, perform, like a, like a, maybe like a Taimu when he used to play Medic. If you had someone shouting at him, it might motivate him to perform better. But it's not gonna help. Uh, it's not gonna help uh, something that lacks composure. So yeah, having a good team around you. But we'll we'll skip that question for now. Um, as demo is a grenade spam actually a fireball, and if it is when, actually the snap one thirty. When we go through the demo of century seven, there will be a situation where um, I'm not sure if there's gonna be that much grenade spam, but it's certainly viable and hopefully I can highlight it to you in the actual example of the game rather than just talk about it. But yeah, it, it is viable. Um, don't worry, Christian Nixoda, you can always find a team in this game. Uh, you, there's plenty of places to find them. Hopefully, in team, if you play Team Orlando, you'll find some friends to play with. But if not, you, it's just about meeting people and finding friends. But yeah, we'll, we'll go through um, this demo now. I think we've talked enough. Uh, as we get to loading it, um, I could talk about off-classing, off like when you off-class funds, what classes you do. So just go through each 
off class, like um, starting with Pyro, like when you typically see it played as we load the demo. Yeah, sure. And it's the gully demo, right? Yeah, and just just before I want to apologize to people, I'm when I'm not exactly a professional, very good at streaming, so you are going to see me. Um, we're not going to be cut into scenes and stuff. You're going to see me go in console and type some stuff. So just ignore that part. Yeah, I'm just trying to get the demo up too. Okay, there we go. So yeah, um, off classes. Uh, in general, off classes again are mainly done when you're holding last points or when you're in the stalemate situations because that's when you have the time to switch off classes and that's when their their usability sort of comes into play. So pyro in general is just seen when you're holding last points because although it's recent buffs to its damage output are uh, pretty good in making it a offensive class, in general it's not going to be too good to run instead of a soldier or a scout because it's not as good situationally. So yeah, Pyro on last has the role of denying the enemy uber, that'll be with the air blast of course, and reflecting projectiles to try and keep his team alive for as long as possible so they can kite the uber. Um, another role they may have is keeping the sentry alive by reflecting rockets if your team is running an engineer, and then also clean up towards the end of the enemy uber charge it is quite powerful as pyro because of the high damage output from the flamethrower again. But yeah, um, that's usually when you see a pyro run and it's when it's most effective, as having a scout versus an uber team isn't too useful. So yeah, that's pyro. I guess the next off class would be heavy. Heavy in uh, the same way as seen on last points usually. Not so much to deny Ubers, but to put out high amounts of damage after an Uber has ended because it forces the enemy team to focus you, and that is essentially what you're trying to achieve. By making the enemy team focus you, you can allow your team to put damage onto people that aren't looking at them and gives you a higher chance of holding the last push, especially against teams that may be running on Uber advantage against you which is when they are using an uber in and you haven't quite got yours yet, or maybe very far off. So yeah, heavy is basically all about the distraction and the damage. Engineer, again, as we went over earlier, uh, as an answer to one question, is usually just going to be ran on last with a sentry either guarding the point or guarding a area in which you expect the enemies to walk into. Similarly to heavy, it makes the enemy team look at it and have to put damage into it in order to take it down, otherwise they're not going to be able to get much further in their push. So yeah. I mean, sentry guns is pretty self-explanatory with engineer. Uh, anything I've missed? So sniper and spy. And then snipe, sniper and spy. Sniper is probably the more well, it is the more common off class that's seen because a lot of teams run snipers in places other than just last points. Obviously, on last point, on last points, you can use sniper to force the enemy team to use their uber as they come into last, because. If a medic is walking straight into your last point and he has a sniper dot at him, he's basically got the choice of using his uber or risking dropping the uber and pretty much losing the push for his team. But, on the other hand, you've also got aggressive sniper plays. For, ex uh, for example, when you're pushing last, you may run a sniper as the entry pick sort of player. He may look for quick shots from the enemy team's lobby, for example, onto the medic or just onto players that he sees as stragglers. Um, these quick picks mean that your team already has a player advantage as the push is beginning and it just basically makes it easier to push last. Similarly, this could also happen on when you're holding mid or when you're holding second. Snipers usually... Well, we'll all over we will see uh, examples of that in this demo, I should say. But, and uh, yeah. just quickly about Spy, um, you actually can see this on the stream if you're looking now. Um, if you look on the bottom, on the bottom left, the blue team, you can see Flash. Um, you can see his class icon is Spy right now. Um, and what he's actually doing is checking the class classes of the, um, the red team. Um, because as you as you know in Spy, if you can you can go disguise and you um, there's a HUD element and when you go disguise as an enemy, where you can see the enemy player's name and what weapon they're using. So. It's interesting to note, you'll see that in this game, but otherwise Spy is used as, um, as Funz was saying about Sniper, it's generally used as to get what's called a pick or a, a kill that will impact the game and break a stalemate. Um, usually it, they, they will target the Medic, but you can see Spy is used in um, to target other players as well. But 
we won't. I don't think we'll see that much at all in this. Uh, yeah, and uh, Snap One One Thirty said checking the medigun as well. I think that's probably what he's doing in spawn. Uh, I'm trying to find his pop actually. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, actually. So um, yeah, ab about Thalash playing spy. Um, I think it actually got more pop popularized by our team uh, <laughs> running off <laughs> yeah. classes so much that people would start playing spy in spawn. And I think on Gully especially, what Thalash is doing is checking if Credu is going to be running Sniper to mid, because that's a strat that we do quite a lot. Obviously, he'll check the Medigun as well to see if we're playing crits. But yeah, I think Seven are just smart in that they'll make sure they know if we're running a Sniper on the mid. I think by, they go into by the time Lopanda was established as a Premiership team, every team was running the Spy and Spawn against us. But yeah. Um... Yeah, so those are those are kind of the roles. Uh, I think we talked long enough. We guess we'll go watch some TF two. Um, quickly, we'll I guess we'll have to talk about the rollouts. Um, but it has the added bonus of us spectating the rollout, so it's going to be slightly annoying to watch. But just before we look at this first mid, um, we're just going to look at the rollout of uh, every class quickly. So I guess we'll start with the demo man because they have the most more interesting rollouts. Let's see if I can find Elicor. Um, so we're rolling here. Okay, I've done very badly this. Um, I'll have to redo that from Cadus's pov. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> I think I found him. Are we back to 34,000 again? Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> this is the beginning of the end. Exactly. Uh, maybe I shouldn't show the rollouts, but it's it's something I <laughs> actually let, let's show the rollouts after, like on the server or something. In fact, should we just yeah, do that, it now? That'll make, that'll make more sense. No, uh, I mean we can do it at the end. If we'll you guys want to see the rollout now, just just let we'll go through some rollouts if you want, or we'll just do them at the end. Um, if I just keep going through the demo, it's just gonna be a mess. Well, we could just go through them in the server, but we will show you them. Uh, Nay. No. Okay, let's watch this game. Right. The, the majority has spoken. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay, let's uh, just just before we start, um, this is the Essentials monthly number two, I think. Or is it three? I can't remember. Two grand final. I oh, know it's number three. Grand final. Um, Ascent EU versus seven. Seven are on the blue, Ascent on the red. You'll notice... Um, Seven have their standard lineup, which is AMS or Ampis, as he's tagged up on Scout, with Falash on Scout, Cadus on Demoman, Raymond on Medic, Drac on Roma Soldier, and Captain on Pocket Soldier. Um, in this team, typically, f I f believe, is Falash Seymour as typically as the Pocket Scout role? No, it's actually AMS. Oh, okay. Um, interesting. So. Your team, you might as well go through them. You've got a slightly different roster than your normal one, but go through them. Uh, anyway. Yeah, so I think for this match, Josh wasn't able to play, so we had our intern Eskimo, who's just a uh, sub for us this season. And he was playing pocket for us in this game and for the games in the cup. But yeah, he's a top, he's recently like played in top high, I believe, and is just making his sort of transition into Prem, so we've picked him up as a sort of mentor. -y. Uh, but yeah, other than that, we've got our normal roster, which I went through earlier. Cool. Yeah, uh, we got a request to explain the medic heal order. We'll show you that later. Um, when we spectate a medic to middle. But yeah, let's, uh, gonna watch this first mid fight. Just a general overview. I actually can't remember what happened when I looked at this earlier. So let's have a look what happens. And funds can justify why his team lost or if they won. Yeah, well, I'm not exactly sure when you played, but we can go with this. Um, I'm going to play and go live in three, two, one. Play demo. Yeah. Tell me when you, get, when you get to 940 and I'll play. Uh, oh, you're at 940, okay. No. Oh, there we go. All I'm seeing on this mid is uh, just doing a bird's eye view. Drax gone behind on drop down. Flanked you guys. Yeah. This is a okay. So this is a pretty common mid. Should we pause here to go over that quickly? Sure. Yeah. I'm just gonna say I know quite a bit about this mid from this one because this is a pretty common one they do versus us usually. So. 
I think Seven and Gully likes to play with their soldiers quite aggressively, and what they'll usually do is they'll have one soldier do a really high bomb, so he's hard to shoot uh, by the scouts, so I have a pretty hard time dealing with him. He'll just jump straight over the map and try and land somewhere on our side, usually around Elder. Oh, you mean Captain? Oh, uh, yeah, ca I think it was Captain. Yeah, he right? did that yeah, on yeah. that mid, and Drac yeah, went so, dropped yeah. down. Captain did that. Uh, what that has the effect of it all is it'll make people on my team think about him and try and anticipate when he's going to attack us. And then as they do this, they have Drac do the other direction. Uh, he'll sort of go into drop down and get ready to flank us. And then the mix of both soldiers sort of pressuring us from two directions forces our team back. And then as soon as they aggress, we basically just get crushed on this mid. If people so yeah, this is like a really common one they've been doing. People are confused about map positions. I just like... Uh... I could just explain them what you mean a bit. If you if you're confused about them, just ask us. If you don't know what anything means, but yeah, yeah. Uh, we're gonna I'm just gonna see how the rest of this round plays out because I think this is a quick one. <laughs> Very likely. Just count down whenever you're gonna play. Uh oh. Um, I may have already played it. <laughs> it's alright. Just go. Yeah, just go. It's the stream that I'm watching. Yeah, this is a very quick quick round. I'm not gonna really talk too much about it. Particularly, because now you can see for people we were talking about earlier the Uber charge. Seven have used the Uber yeah. charge. So that um, was basically an instant. And there. Ascent did not have the Uber charge, so they were invincible. Yeah. I'm just gonna keep playing. But as, that's basically the worst case scenario uh, in a round. So if your team loses your medic, on, you pause. Okay, that's cool. If you if your team loses your medic on mid, it means you're gonna have a Uber disadvantage if their med doesn't die. And then in addition to that, if your entire team gets wiped as well, uh, that is all of your players die, it means you're not going to have any chance of holding second. And depending on when your spawn times are, you also have a very diminished chance of holding last. So in this example, my entire team died. They had full uber advantage, so they could just walk straight into last, take all the ground, and then none of our off classes have been set up. You may have seen I tried to go pyro right at the end, but it was too late. And they just stormed two scouts onto the point. Nice. A one minute round there. Yeah, that's a one minute. That's a classic. Uh, from I think this, this game is like three one overall. No, it's not. But we'll we'll, we'll see later. Um, <laughs> I can't remember. Don't want to spoil the surprise. Uh, I've paused. Uh, uh, if you want to know, I've paused at tick three eight four oh eight. Um, but we, what we're going to do on this mid, we're going to look at. We're not going to watch the entire game through. We're going to look at um, all the mids, like or not all of the mids, but some most of the mids from different perspective. We're talking about the seven soldiers in the last mid, they're fun, so let's let's see what the... We're going to look at this mid a couple of times, but let's see what they both do. So let's look at... Um, let's look at Drac's point of view first. Okay. Just give me a countdown. Yeah, three, two, one, go. Here he is, Dracky. Uh, we'll look at this a couple of times, so we'll go back. So that's this is a soldier Roma rollout, by the way, you can see... He's doing a very standard one, but this is not standard. He so he goes aggressive early, then he drops down, and then he goes drop down behind into drop down, and then he's on the medic again and kills on Breck. Uh, the medic controlling the health pack, and then he completely outplays Chris there before our man funds cleans him up. But I think the mid's over at this point, maybe not quite yet. That's where they were. But yeah, let's. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to the start of that. It's tick uh, thirty nine thousand. We'll pause at the start again. Yeah, we can just. I mean, again, it's a similar mid to the one I explained first, but we can just slowly look over what he does exactly. It was a very good mid from him, but one of the things I noticed. Um, yeah, that's weird. My tick seems to have stopped. Okay, here we go. One of the things I noticed was how Captain made that mid possible for his t for him. Which I will show you people in a second when I can sort out this demo UI. Could you enable view models or something, Carla? Are you being asked? Yeah, I have a... I probably shouldn't have my mumble button down as B, because then I've got all of this crap in there. Beat the button. sort of what's going on right now <laughs> yeah the uh i just gotta get to the tick okay yeah 
39,000. So yeah, let's look at this from the point of view of um, Captain, because I notice he does something interesting. So we're going to unpause in three, two, one, go. So here's Captain for Team 7. Now, it doesn't look like it does much here. You're shooting him a lot here, and then he gets annihilated by both scouts. But no, that, that, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't look like he did anything, but what yeah, really should be... Like what, he, what should be the two scouts of Ascent be doing? What should one of them be doing? Yeah, so... the I mean, what happened here was... Captain, as I... Uh, well, the mi it's actually the same mid they did last mid, basically, just with a slight twist in there. So Captain jumps up, he makes at least one of our scouts look at him and try to deny him, which is what I was doing there, and I think Credu was doing it there as well. But by making us both look at him, what he enabled was Drac just walking in through drop down and killing our med. But that isn't necessarily up to the scouts to deal with, so it's just another, it's another case of the two soldiers working together to achieve the same thing. One of them doing the distraction play whilst the other comes in for the cleanup. But yeah, usually you're going to have at least one scout dedicated to looking out for soldiers that are jumping the team. If you're pushing two scouts to do that job, it means that other areas of the map are going to be sort of open to other players. Cool, okay. I just got to rebuy my uh, push to talk. And that's <laughs> another quick round, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, I hill, yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't like... Watch it to the end. We'll we'll go to the uh, third mid. Um, but but you said it was the same mid that they did last time. It was all made by Captain's bomb as a distraction. Yep. Which basically, like f three people from the team, maybe even four, were just completely focused on him the entire time, and nobody tracked track behind. So yeah. So a uh, decent counter to the whole Roma drop down play is usually to have your pocket kind of stick around the choke with a decent buff, which means that as soon as a Roma comes up, he can just dispatch him quickly or at least prevent him from doing the things he does. In this situation, I guess we didn't have our pocket looking there. And then our two scouts were so distracted that Jack was able to just come in and kill our medic instantly. Okay, well, yeah. gonna go to tick 45,000, which is the next, uh, next bit and see the next mid. So this mid, I'm going to look at uh, something different, which is the demo man, and specifically Eleko, and how the demo man can tr can control the mid and win your team the mid just by having position. So we'll find your buddy Eleko. Uh, that's not him. Here he is, um, and we'll see what he does. But it's going to be he doesn't do very much. He gets one kill, but it's all about his position that wins Ascent this mid. So let's have a look at it. I'm going to unpause in three, two, one. Obviously, here you get to see the Demo Man roll out as well, which is uh, on Gully Wash. So this is um little neat one where you go on the left. Um, this is the most common rollout. So he puts his first sticky on the big door to try and get some early damage. But he sees Falash trying to go up left, so he insta-pipes him. And you see how he's got complete control over the point here. Seven have completely gone out, because what you'll see, because I'm going to rewatch this again. Um, pause it and go back to 45,000, because what you'll see on this mid, I'm going to look at Cadus's point of view, the demo man for seven, and compare his position to Elacor's. Yeah, Elko's so a I'm just getting to that pretty too. good player. Indeed he is. That was a cheeky pick from him at the beginning of that mid. Like, who's POV around now? Watching Cadus. Yeah. We're going to compare what they do differently. Yep. They do the same rollout, is um, the first thing I should mention. Uh, I'm going to unpause in 3, 2, 1. Uh, he's going to go for the top left. Cadus is one of the best demos for rollouts. He has lots of guides on YouTube, uh, I think. On this, So if you want to check out his rollouts, you can go there. But you see, he goes top left, but 
he drops to the floor on this mid, and now he has no position on the point at this point. Well, Elecor does, and they have. So you see, they instantly decide to leave because of that kill Elecor got on Flash as well, which made a huge difference. But if you look at the HP, Funds is actually two HP, um, and Chris is ninety three, Drax nineteen HP. I think yeah. Drax did a really nice escape rocket jump but yeah, it's uh, actually we try to bust in and take the fight but then our combo can't quite get in i think it's because kada stickies off the choke which means that the rest of us are reluctant to get in and the pillows that did manage to oh, i paused i down. paused the game dude yeah, yeah. focus it on mids but yeah you see um seven you see how positions demo man won them that mid and that kill on flash um the seven are smart enough team to know that that mid was going to be lost already so they left instantly um that's a good example of how a demo man can win you a mid just by doing one thing uh i'm gonna look at another mid this mid's from the perspective of i mean i think this is going to be raymond's perspective this one i actually this is my favorite mid of the game funds you'll see why in a second it's gonna it's tick seventy four thousand. all right let's get there I didn't realize you'd paused. I thought you'd gone on to a little yeah, push. I'm, push I'm, bas push I'm basically just pausing. Was. I'm basically just yeah. pausing. We're focusing on the mids right now so people can, you know, yeah, observe them. Observe them. Uh, oh, we were just getting cheeky and extending it. All right, I'm on Roman's POV. Somebody won that round. I wonder who won that one. I think you guys did, didn't you? Uh, we probably went at least one round this game, I'm sure. Not that I can remember we'll, too much. I'm just going to say, we're going to watch this mid from two perspectives, maybe even three. Um, one's going to be Raymond's, one's going to be a player on Ascent. Um, a certain a certain scout on Ascent, just uh, thought I'd mention that. Uh, I'm going to unpause in three, two, one. So here's Raymond. Um, you can't really see it, but he's healing the demo man here and then buffing the pocket. To 300 so he can rocket jump then he buffs both the scouts and uses their movement speed to get to mid quick then he arrows drac the roamer gets him to full hp then he gives him a buff then he gets onto cadus here on the left heals him and then let's just watch from here that's his heal order so he's just healing people at the moment nice arrow uh, on chris to keep him alive oh i should turn view models on that'll make life easier We'll watch that again in a second. Uh, did you see him jump over a sc scout's head? <laughs> <laughs> you see him jump over your head? I think I saw that, yeah. Uh, let me turn view models on. Yeah, I just about caught that. Yeah, let's uh, redo this mid as well. Let's go back to 674,000. Apologies, people. Uh, my bad. I don't play with view models on in-game. See, I'm going to watch that again from Raven's point of view, but with view models, so it's a little easier for people to watch. So yeah, I'm going to, are you ready, fans? Yeah, I'm ready. Three, two, one, go. So here he is again. Just remember, demo man, pocket, scout, scout, back to pocket, Roma. He goes pocket again, and then he goes on to demo man at here. That's a typical heal order. I like he's just waiting here, but I like this arrow kill that he gets. And then Ombrak is dead, the Ascent Medic, so your team are trying to kill him now. Uh, and then he just jumps over your head. <laughs> that was, I think I remember that, actually. <laughs> he completely baits you on this mid. Yeah, but he still has to survive here. Like he's uh, he's playing around his team to survive because he knows that Ombrak is dead, that the red players are gonna try and kill him, so he's looking to dodge. But he's not trying to like um, completely bait his team out. Yeah, he's yeah. just standing in a place where he can get heals out either through arrows or his medibeam and try and minimise his 
damage taken, which is why he's sort of standing in the area where it's harder for a soldier to get onto him. And then as you saw, I didn't have too much luck rushing him either, as he both jumped over my head and had people around him. Let's, uh, let's just, let's just watch out again from your path. Hmm. This might be bad. Can't wait to witness these three shots missed in the nerf. Apparently I was streaming at the time according to Solo. Did not remember that. God. So long ago. Oh you mean Martin. Huh? You mean Martin, right? Solo? Oh yeah, exactly. Hello panda memes. Okay. Work people will get this reference. Yeah, I'm ready to go again. Let's see. Three. I'm on my POV. Two, one. Let's see what I do this mid. I don't think it's anything special considering how bad. I think you got some redemption coming up funds, don't you worry? Yeah. Let's get onto that quickly then. Alright, no. so I'm just jumping up the left. Quickly getting to Elacor, which I usually do. Narrowly dodging a rocket. You got tagged by a sticky from Kalos, I think. Yeah. I'm just playing my usual pocket position, waiting for people to be able to shoot. Ooh. I beef a few shots onto Captain, who is already able to take down our med. Yikes. You weren't even looking at him, to be fair. To yeah, I was actually looking at the scout, because I knew that scout was weak and he was about 10 HP. So. Just just quickly, let's pause it. Just explain, why would you go for Ampus there, just so people know, instead yeah, of Raymond? A, that's a good point, actually. So, yeah, in that situation, I could easily just try and focus the med down, but... Because I know the scout's already weak, I think I have a decent chance of just dealing with the DM classes. And if I am able to kill the DM classes, it means that either me or my team... I think it might just have been one soldier, or one demo at the end there, actually. So, But yeah, me or my team would have been able to ke uh, kill the medic afterwards, essentially, is the point. Um, at the time, we just thought we had a higher chance if we were able to kill the DM players and then the medic, rather than letting them shoot us as we go for the med. But yeah. A lot of the time, you do want to... Contrary to what you may think, not just focus the med. Obviously, there's situations where it completely is required to, uh, to just focus the med, but a lot of the time, if you can deal with the DM classes, then you're going to have more success. Yeah, because it would have been a lot easier for you to kill Raymond if Am Ams was dead, and it was just Cadus defending Raymond. Demon yeah. Man is not very as good at defending medics as a scout. And I think it actually was quite unlucky. We were quite close to killing that scout and probably Raymond. So yeah, that's just the play we went for at the time. It's fine though. You, uh, it was a worthy attempt, but um, that was just all for you medic mains out there. Wanted to see Raymond um, jump over Funz's head. Uh, it, look at the last mid. Um, this one we can focus on you, Funz, and specifically specifically sorry the scout roll it's tick 81,000 again I, I apologize that people have to see this yeah we're gonna watch uh, you here so are you ready yeah I'm ready three two one rounds just ended where is the sent funds Quickly try and get onto my own cam. Alright, I found myself. Uh, we'll just, just we'll watch it a couple of times, I guess. But the thing I I liked about this mid was how you controlled the area. I guess you can explain a little bit more as the mid goes on. Yeah, let's see. So I roll out choke, which means I'm going to be protecting my demo on this mid. A soldier does his usual bomb straight over us, so I decide not to chase him because I'd be giving up my ground. And I've spotted the soldier behind us. I don't want to commit to him either because it means that I have a high chance of getting rocketed. So essentially I just want to deny people as they jump, which is what I do with Captain there. I see Ams, I know it's not a worthy chase because he's got a buff and I'm giving up my ground. But Thalash is on the ground and we're kind of thinking about what's going and that's what we do. We're just cleaning up now and essentially what I gathered that I did there was instead of chasing players that I saw, I just kept my ground and ensured they weren't going to be able to get anywhere away from where they are and left the main damage up to my teammates instead of just going for 1v1s myself. Which is, I think, quite an important thing for scouts to get into doing, especially towards higher levels of play, is just not think that you have to go for every 1v1. You see your importance as a denying class as well as a DM class. 
The other thing as well is positioning on the mid, um, how you kept your discipline. And the one time you didn't keep your discipline was the one time you almost lost your medic. And if Ombrak didn't do a good surf, we'll watch. We'll rewatch the pov again, but we'll look at it. Oh yeah, I didn't. I don't think I actually caught that. But well, you you that, see. I guess that just goes to show like what good teams will do in order to exploit things they can that they see holes in. Like they could have gone for my med at any point of that mid, but they go for the they go for my med at the time. Uh, just so some of it's pure cool. luck, pure luck. But yeah, it's um it's just the way it works. So it's uh, skill, man. It's skill, you know. But let's uh, rewatch that again. Three. Oh wait, one second. Uh, yeah, eighty-one thousand. Okay. Not quite. I only just pressed it. Okay. Yep. Okay. Three, two, one. We're looking at me again. Of course, man. Nice. That's what I like to hear. So here, here's uh, I know it's about all the stuff. Um, not looking at who you're, who you're shooting. Just you spend the entire mid. Um, uh, you spend the entire mid on the high ground here. Like you're obviously your position is to jump around the boxes, so you're in a good position with nice soldiers. Um, and you're on top of the point here. Now this kill there, you choose to jump back on the point rather than fall down, and you do that the entire time. You're like on top of the point here. They can't get forward. It's only here when you drop down on Falash that Drac get jumps on Brac. Like if you like, as soon as um, Falash dropped down there. And you, if you stayed on the point, you would have been able to kill Drac quicker. If it wasn't for a good surf by Umbrak, he could have died there. Yeah. But you see the importance um, for newbies watching that keeping your position um, as a player is key to protecting your medic or your demo man rather than chasing frags that your team are going to get anyway. If you understand what I mean. We will watch that again from Umbrak's point of view. Yeah, sure. I'm good, no, no. Whilst he screams at a soldier on me. Yeah, I suppose in that situation I just completely let it slip that there was still a soldier behind. Whereas I should have been actively making sure that he wasn't going to go for my med. And I think also I didn't really consider the fact that my soldier was just going to clean up that kill. I thought I would have had an easy kill just dropping down onto that scout. But I mean, it's all hindsight. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, three, two, one. Where is Ombrak? Where is he? Here he is. So he's doing the... You could notice, by the way, his heal order. You have a sniper on this mid as well, which makes it slightly different mid um, to talk about. Yeah. We can talk about that um, in a second. So he's he goes up left. Soldier and drop down's kind of keeping him from coming up. Oh, he's lucky there. He takes a rocket. Sure. He spends the most of the mid very, very passive. Yeah, so Drax actually done quite a good job this mid, but despite that, it's not quite winning his team. Yeah, so at this point, this is when I should have turned around and made sure that I was looking, because Umbrak surely called that there was a soldier about to jump. Oh, I yeah. think that is actually what I probably did, but I'd already committed to dropping down at that point. So it was, yeah, as you said, quite unlucky timing. Drax was Drax very smart in like how he stayed alive and just kept busy but because your team was running the sniper it kind of changed things but let's just talk about the sniper mid um quickly just like um, i'm gonna I'm gonna pause it just just because just talk about the sniper mid um how does it work or am i giving away too many strats no I, I mean it's quite general like if any team's gonna run a sniper on golly wash they always roll out the sniper big doors and just keep them in big doors for the most part all they're going to be doing is just looking out for people. I mean, ideally, playing Sniper on Gully Wash, you're going to have to get picks quite quickly for it to be effective, mm -hmm. or at least be putting out damage, because if you're just standing in Big Door without doing much, you're basically just putting a player down on your team. So yeah, you're just going to be looking for heads that you can shoot early on in the mid in order to make them know that they are not allowed to walk onto the point. Um, of course, because of the way that the map is structured, it does make you quite an easy target. So lots of teams do 
play around having a second class near the sniper who can then focus on the person who goes to shoot the sniper. But yeah, it's just your sort of general sniper mid going for picks. It's okay. just an alternative to the passive reaction mid, seeing if you can open up something first. Cool, man. Well, we've gone through enough mids, I think. We'll look at some uh, some other stuff, parts of the game. Um, people that uh, don't play or watch a lot of sixes, mid fights um, will start every round off, but what will happen as the rounds develop is you'll get different situations and they're usually based on um, two things, the uber charge and who has the advantage, uh, the advantage being who has u which team has uber and which team doesn't have uber and which team will get it first. And, and they're also based off how many people are alive on each team. So if a team has one or two less people than the other team, um, they can push the other point and have an advantage. Um, depending on things like respawn times, so we'll we'll look at uh, we'll look at some pushes into last. Actually, I think um, I don't want this to go on go to go on too long. So we'll have a look at uh, how teams push with uber advantage into last point. So I guess we'll go to yes. I'm sorry, demo UI again. We'll uh, we'll go to tick forty one thousand. See an uber advantage push. One. Looks like seven have won the mid and are probably going to be the ones doing the pushing. Yep. Um, that's that's what happens. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is just the one they insta roll again. Uh, this is actually it's already one nil at this point. This wasn't the first round. This is the yeah. second round. Um, for this one, I'm going to look at Elecor. Now I'm a play. I play demo man, so I can sort of talk about what Elecor wants to do in this. Um, and what he's doing. So the mid's been won by seven. I'm going to unpause in three, two, one now. The mid's been won by seven, so seven are moving onto the second point, which your team will give up so you can get a better defense. Now, Elecor actually survived. So he, r he comes back to last. Now, because Uber disadvantage, he's taken a long time to decide what he wants to do, but he decides to sticky the point and then hide in here. This part of the map is called sneaky because you're very sneaky if you go here. Now, what okay. he wants to be doing as a demo is surviving the Uber and guarding the point. Uh, so as seven push above, um, he's just waiting for someone to either come onto him here or to go on the point. Now, your team are starting to lose a few players, but he re he, the thing that he fails at is guarding the point. God, yeah. <laughs> By the looks of it. Now, I, I, I'll go back to like, um, to tick uh, 41,000 and again, just quickly. Yeah, so but the, the thing you notice about that is um, Well, yeah, I think the general idea of uh, holding last where your demo sticks the point is your team has to try and, like, <laughs> alternatively to what we just did, try and stay alive for as long as possible, and then that'll pressure the enemy team into wanting to play the point, which is when his sticky trap comes in play, and he can deny people from doing that. It just basically means your team doesn't have to focus on the point because your demo has got it covered, or apparently doesn't. Yeah, that... <laughs> I'd so say we'll again, I guess. 99 times out of 100, uh, uh, when the team has uber advantage, the defending team's demo man will sticky the point, well, not all the time, but a lot of the time um, on most maps. Uh, but I'm just going to go again in 3, 2, 1, 2, restart in the tick. Um, the thing, I'm, I'm going to pause it in a second and... Uh, as he starts laying the stickies down, just so I want to highlight this to any new demo man players. When you put stickies on the point, uh, just see where he puts his stickies here. He just puts basic stickies, just going to pause it and now. Oh, actually, no. That's, that's kind of bad. But you see, did you see where he put those stickies? Um, he's going to put a few more up. I'm going to unpause it a second and pause it again. 9.50 on the clock. 
from here, he, he only put five stickies on the point. He put two on the front, two at the back, one in the middle. You can only see three on my point of view because I'm very bad at this. Uh, that's uh, those are not are out, yeah. those are not very good stickies. Yeah, I mean the problem with those sticks is they're they're not very intimidating to look at. It's like a scout could just shoot the two or even the one at the front and easily play the corner of the point without dying. You usually want the stickies to at least be in a way that it will kill the first person who's going to start capping at yeah. the very least. Typically, demo men will put a lot more stickies on the point, or they'll hide the stickies, or they'll put them in. They'll use a put away on the point, or they'll hide the stickies, or they'll put them in places where they're hard to destroy, like, um, so the scouts can't do what uh, I think Ams does here. We're gonna just unpause it again. Um, in three, two, one, and just see when this push comes in. Obviously, your team makes a few other mistakes than Elico does, but I just want to highlight this. Here's the Uber. Just watch the scout when he comes on the point. Heavy dead instantly. Oh, it's Drac actually that stands on the point with Pain Tray. I mean, Elico doesn't even debt them, but Drac just stands on one sticky. He knows that if the, he gets debts on, he'll probably survive anyway. Because there's literally just one sticky on him. But you see how they weren't very effective. If he'd put stickies on, you see this wall I'm looking at now, stream, if he'd put like four stickies above on that wall, and then put the rest of the stickies um, like on this rim here. He'd completely cover the entrance, which this is the point apart from the above entrance, but it's very difficult to do that jump and land in the middle and not die to stickies instantly. It would be a much more effective way of using his stickies. Don't worry um, if that is the real Helico or Elico. Don't worry, yeah, you, 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 there's plenty of redemption for you in this uh, demo. Preschool is picking on a college student. I played the game twice as long as Elico have. This is a professor picking on a college student. I'm also in this game. So. A more talented college college student, should I say? <laughs> but yeah, um. <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, importance of stickies on the point. I guess we'll highlight from that one. Uh, but uh, we'll go to another one actually, Elico, where you get some redemption along with funds. This is an uber advantage push perspective so we look at the team that's pushing and if the cent that's going to push this is going to be tick 70 uh 1700 i apologize again that you have to see all this everybody by the way you ready funds i'm ready Okay, this is an uber advantage push from your team. It's only 30 like 30 percent the advantage. So if you look at the corner, you see Ombrak has 92 percent here, and Raymond has 62 percent. So there's a 30 percent advantage for a cent. So it's key for you guys to push quickly here. So we're gonna watch Elicor's pov again. Well, you can watch your own because you're gonna both work together and see what how you guys approach this with your uber. Yeah, what's your uh, what's your time at the top right now? F it says 532 it's just about to be capped fourth I'm point like, somehow i'm a bit, of a bit ahead of you even though i'm on the same tech but whatever let's go three two one so we're looking at elico you and him are going main now he does a sticky jump here and he gets a really nice sticky on on, Bra on raymond at the exact time you shoot him and you manage to catch Raymond out like literally five seconds before he gets Uber. And because because you've got that medic kill and the enemy team aren't sell up with off classes, which we'll talk about later, it's quite easy for you to clean up the rest of their players. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So that was actually a really good push. I'm going to pause it again just, just so I can look at your... Uh, so I can boost your ego um, funds. Let's let's look at your point of view. Seventy one thousand again. Seventy one thousand five hundred. Sorry. Uh, 
I really wish this demo system worked better. So I don't have to do this every time. Yeah, three, two, one, go. Yeah, the the idea of this Uber push is you've got to go quickly, you've got to focus the medic. That's why you go main here. Now Raymond actually is a little bit out of position. He should be close to the spawn door, but this is still really good um, aggression by you guys to catch him out. And then you die to Drac, but you do a lot of damage to him. Yeah, I get him down to like, what was it, 20 HP or something. I managed to die somehow, but then I've done enough damage so that the rest of the team can just follow up. I was just basically going into water, expecting Cadus to be there. Not knowing Drac was also there. But Feels bad, man. The best of the situation. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's an example of how aggression um, is really good. Like the way Elicor sticky jumped to chase the medic there was really good and hit that sticky on Raymond. At the same time, you hit him with your scatter gun shot. It's also how it's important to count Ubers and use your advantage, even if it's only thirty percent. Uh, so that's pretty good um, play by you guys. Um, I'm going to look at uh, another uber advantage push on last, but this time from Seven's perspective as they attack. Um, so this is going to be a tick number 78,500. So yeah, the... Uh, I can see you're running the engineer, by the way. Uh, we were talking about that earlier, about off-classing, and Creddy's running the pyro. But we're going to watch this from the perspective of... Um, let's watch it from, say, Cadus's perspective. Sure. I'm going to unpause in three, two, one. So you've got about 50% advantage. You're going to Uber through top right here. They're using the stickies to get the gun down and kill this pyro. Um, now, here's the thing that you've got to notice, um, how Cadus is keeping his position on the top right. Uh, and he used it to sticky the right door. And hits a nice pipe on Ascent Ombrak. And then yeah. it's just about killing Elicor in Sneaky, finish it off. Although... But that, that push was all about positioning, again, as their man, like, a lot of people will think um, obsessed about frags, but because Cadus kept that position on top right, um, he could control the right spawn and force the entire team on the left. I think he might have let a soldier slip through on the right, but his it's, his team were able to, they were able to kill the guy who challenged him on the top right. It's all about the famous after Uber positioning with those pushes. Yeah, if so you, if you can get that, it means you're gonna have successful last pushes. I think Cadus and I don't know about how Elicor plays his pushes, but I think him and maybe myself are one of the few demo man that just play after Uber positioning on top right. Uh and he does it better than anybody else. But that's why it's important to learn that you don't as demo man you don't always just want to be jumping around like trying to use all your ammo up um, in the fight and go for frags. It's okay to sit back and reload and just hold some ground. Um, we're going to move this on quickly because we've been doing this for quite a while now, actually, so maybe over an hour, so we'll just we'll just go quicker. Um, tick 105,000. I don't know how many new people are even watching this anymore, if they're just confused about what's going on. But yeah, if you still if you still have any questions about anything... Please, please ask. Willing to answer them. I am. Um, I'm not willing to answer questions from Elicor. Sorry, Elicor. I got this. This is a, a stream. The stream isn't for you. I'm sure Ombrak will uh, do a demo review with you soon. Got to check how those scrims went tonight, actually, because I missed some valuable practice time to do this. Let's see if I can embarrass Elicor. Uh, solid performance. Alright, are you at this tech anyway? Not yet. Ok, 
Okay, this one is a tick from. Uh, this is uh, a def actual a defense. Now we're going to look at it from your team's defending perspective. Um, we we'll look at two things because we're on the topic of Elecor and Devaman. Let's look at Elecor first. This is um, an example of how you should play defensive Devaman on last. So I'm going to unpause it in three, two, one. So what Elecor's doing is um, he's holding on to the point. It's sort of in sneaky now. And he's put some stickies on the point and he's put four stickies there. Well, the point of this is to stop anyone coming into water. This area is called water because there used to be water here. Earlier versions of the map. Now he's sitting here. He's waiting for this Drac. He gets the kill on Drac. When Drac comes in, and he goes immediately goes back to the point. You see the Seven are in the same position as before. They've taken the position. But this time... Um, because that threat is eliminated in water, Elecor can come in and help them retake the position. And just for good measure, he kills, he predicts where Falash is. That was a complete slam, what the f Yeah, that was a example of how you play Demoman well on, on defense. You see, Seven did exactly the same thing. I'm going to pause it again. They did exactly the same thing as they did last time. Um, well, I, I don't know if, if Drac was playing the water last time or not. But they were. They took the position on the top right, and they ran a they ran a heavy as well. Your your team ran a heavy as well at the end. But this time, Elecor was able to have an impact in the fight because he got the kill on Drac in water. So good play, Elecor. Well, uh, we got a question just before we continue. We got a question from Jazz PL. When exactly should you run a heavy on last? No, this was covered. Missed you to certain complicated. Yeah, that's fine. Um, do you want to explain it, funds? I mean, I mean yeah. In fact, we could just just before like um, uh, we'll just go back to the tick and we'll watch Credu because he runs heavy on this last, so you can see it as well as when funds explains it. Yeah, I'm there. I'm ready. I am not as quick as you. That's why you're playing in top prem still. Yeah, as we wait for this to load, um, so we just start. Oh yeah, so, um, I mean, heavy you can play uh, with uber disadvantage with or with, uh, like, equal ubers, because it's just a useful class to have on last in general. Um, in terms of playing it against an uber advantage, so the other team is running an advantage, you can use yourself as a bait to make the other team look at you and then drop back into spawn, perhaps, or maybe even die, but if you can do, just drop back into spawn after making them waste their uber on you. And then you can walk out afterwards again and just basically do damage to people, have the same effect of making the distraction. But then it's also a, just a good class to have on last in general, even if it's a new, like, equal leaders. Because a lot of the time a scout's not able to do too much because of his low health on last and the fact yeah. that it's usually I mean, so, it's on the stream now, you can see... Yeah. Um, I'm sorry I didn't, like, tell you, but you can see how Credu, for those watching the stream, tanked the damage there. He went from 400... HP to like 80, got arrows, and then took like another 100. He tanked probably about, probably 400 to 500 hit, um, damage the entire mid um, fight there. And that really helped um, you guys win that fight as well, because we did watch it from Ehrlichel's point of view, um, where he came out and uh, on top left, but because Credu was taking all that damage and tanking it, um, he was he made all of the seven players waste that ammo on him, and he stayed alive as well, which is really good. Uh, which made it easier for someone like um, Elecor to push top left and retake it. So yeah, that's good. But we, we'll watch this um, one more time, but we'll look at your point of view, because you run another off-class, known as the uh, Pyro class. Mm -hmm. So we'll go back to Tick 500. And then Again. I, I see one other class. Uh question as well. I guess we can address that after this because... Yeah, we need to see you play Pyro. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta do mine. I think I actually die here. Uh, probably overextend a little bit. Yeah, maybe a lot. Anyway, either. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> oh. People watching my stream will understand the pain. I, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm ready now. Just count down. Three, two, one. Let's go. Watch this from your point of view. So you're playing Pyro. Talk us through the Pyro. Uh, so to begin with, I'm just going to be 
attempting to deny people as they come in. As we can see with our wall hacks right now, they're going to be pushing through Shutter. I'm not playing too close, so not to get caught out. And then I sort of divert my attention to the sentry. But then as I begin to back up, Kato hits me with a nice pipe. So I didn't end up doing too much there. But my mere presence, I think, was enough to buy time for my team to rotate, get their health back up, and begin the second part of the defense. So yeah, even though I died there, my role in making them look at me and doing a small bit of uh, denying, I think, helped my team with the last hold. But in general, you want to try and survive, even when you're playing that sort of denying class, because it makes it a bit easier. Yep. Um, I mean, it does, but usually Pyro is a throwaway class as well, on last sometimes. Yeah. If like, you're the only one dying, it doesn't matter too much either. There's two ways you see Pari played. is The way you played it there was just deflecting the spam from Kaders on the sentry, which made him waste ammo on you and the sentry. So he probably shot like his entire clip and he got one kill from it, um, which is pretty pretty good. But the other way you'll see Pyro is they'll play um, close to the choke point, i.e. the shutter door, and they'll try and air blast and keep people at the shutter door. But they will usually nine times out of ten die in that situation but the point is as you said is to allow your team um to distract all of their uber long enough to allow your team to um reposition themselves and refight when the uber fades so that's kind of the you can see how the pyro is used there uh you got some questions here and um, wasn't it somebody was... don basic asked them yeah him and snap have asked a similar question which is uh like when do you know that it's worth making a push and what kind of advantages should well, you be looking for? We have mentioned the we've been showing pushes onto last using the Uber advantage, um, which is often how rounds are won or lost. Uh, but there are other ways ex ways you can push, um, which we will go over as well um, in a minute. But yeah, but yeah uh, when it's a uh, good advantage to push before a push is justified. When it comes to Uber advantage, um, Obviously, the advantage of being um, invincible for eight seconds whilst the enemy team doesn't have that option is a pretty big advantage. Um, but teams generally don't push on like uh, anything smaller than, like I'd say, a 20% or 25%. We saw how you guys caught seven out with a 30% ad earlier. But generally, teams don't push on anything smaller than that. Yeah, like you want to give yourself enough time to get into last and assume that they're not going to get uber because if you're pushing with uber and they're on 90 percent you're essentially just pushing equal ubers because the advantage is so minimal that you're not going to be able to do anything with it so you want at least a decent bit of gap between the two ubers before you classify it as an uber advantage push yeah and um, other people will um other advantages people will push on um I mean, we, there is Crits Krieg in sixes as well, so you'll see that, but it's not in this game specifically. But other advantages people push on will be um, when you get what's called a pick or you have more numbers than the enemy. So, uh, I mean, for example, I pause the stream, Ascent have six players alive, seven have three, Ascent are going to push second point and seven are going to let them have it because if seven fight with three against six, they're going to all die. <laughs> Um, and then they're going to lose the next point and the next point and then be on their last point. So that's um, one example, but we'll go through some more examples. Uh, might as well do it now. A um, couple of uh, scenarios in the game where teams just attack. And um, this is actually teams attack and like change from attack and defending very quickly in these examples, which is probably because it's a prem game which you won't see in other games, like lower level games, but we'll go, we'll look at them anyway. So, uh, tick 48,000. Uh, whilst I wait for funds, could you turn up funds' volume a bit? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think funds is probably. Uh... Can you even send me up on the call? 
don't know. If we, went in, if we went into a server, you'd be able to turn me up. I could probably turn you up a little bit on Discord, but... I don't know. Try that quickly. Okay, well, let's uh, let's go to this back to this tick area. You there? Yeah, I'm there. Forty-eight thousand, right? I can't remember what point this is in the game. It's okay. It's just early in the game. It's two 0 to seven. Um, you guys are. I think you guys have just lost. You guys have won mid, and you've just lost two people trying to. Take seconds, so you're gonna be retreating here. Uh, gonna watch this from uh, I think the perspective of. Um, uh, let's just see how it goes. We'll watch it a couple of times, I guess. The yeah. So we've got Eskimo here. On uh, I'm watching it from a uh, sort of overhead view. Eskimo's jumping away. So now seven are gonna push in. Um, a guy asked really earlier about spamming. Um, that's you see the, how the two soldiers spammed this area here, the choke point. That's generally how that's like how you can stop a push, but that's not why this push was stopped. They got killed somewhere else. So now a center attacking, and we have an uber trade here. This is where the game can really be become a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm watching Eskimo play, go behind, kill captain. Um, as a result of that uber trade, because Seven did not support it, because they had lost players, Ascent are able to capture the point. So I can pause it there. But the f that that was a weird fight because it turned from attack from Seven into defense from Seven really, really quickly. Um, it's not the best example of uh, of a attack, but we could look at the why it's important to keep numbers um, and I think there was a couple of mistakes from the seven players that ended up happening let's, uh, let's just go back to the tick again, 48,000 this is not the clearest example to follow but I'm there I think Falash is the first guy to die, so we'll watch him and see. Because Fla Falash is a f the flank scout, you said, for seven. Yeah, yeah. To watch him. This turns into, as you can see on the top right of my kill feed, Delicor and Funds die. Oops. 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 16 That's second just... respawn. So, Pell, meds. Ascent go from attacking to defending very quickly. Um, gonna unpause in three, two, one. Uh, I want to watch Flash. Actually, there's a whole fight going on here. Flash has been fighting. He wants an arrow. He gets an arrow. So we're gonna push six v four here into middle. Now look at that double spam from the soldiers onto the trade point there. Just completely the damage it does to Flash completely catches him out and Drac also gets caught out by Chris who does a really good bomb there I'm going to pause it again that's uh, really good to see um, the coordination between Chris and Eskimo spamming um, what's the choke point this small area where you can see credit on the screen is now and how Flash instantly went from 4 HP to 0 um, because the rockets both hit him at exactly the same time and that's um, when you're defending and you know the team's going to push you, spamming choke points is very, very, very important in TF2. Because if um, Flash was just allowed to stand there or walk forward and walk in um, for free and not take any damage, then it would be harder to defend because then you have a player that's in your territory to focus on. But because he was stopped there... It, Opened up an opportunity for Chris to jump in and get the second kill on Drac. Um, so yeah, somebody asked really early in the stream about Demoman pipe spamming. 
if Elicor was alive there, he would have been pipe spamming the trick point as well. Um, for that reason, stop to stop people from pushing. Um, the soldiers also did the same to the seven combo, but these frags happened before the seven combo had the chance to do anything. But yeah, that was really good play from Chris and Eskimo. So uh, well done. Any comments, funds, or are you just AFK on the combo, getting carried by your soldiers? Uh, I mean, certainly at this point I wasn't doing too much from the grove, but uh, yeah, I know it's a it's a good play. It's, it's nice to see my flank uh, playing so well. It makes me very happy. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't really care. It's something I'm not very used to. No, I'm joking. Um, and then what happens here is, I'm just going to unpause just to show you a stream what happens, is um, Seven actually take an uber here. Um, now, the because Ams dies in the uber, Seven's aim is to get out alive. So Raymond just abandons his soldier, Captain, who d takes one for the team and dies. And uh, you can see Cadus is actually sticky and forward because he wants to prevent a quick rush to last, which he does succeed on by his time for his team to set up. And then some more stuff happens. Your team loses two people. But that's uh, that's not what I'm going to focus on now. I'm just going to pause it again. Focus on uh, watching another situation where teams are pushing off picks. Uh, Keep up the questions as well. Give us content to talk about. Let's see, I'm going to scan for any questions that we've missed. Well, uh, we've only probably, I'd say we've only got like probably another half an hour to go, maybe. But yeah, you have a look at them. Uh, we're going to go to tick 53,000 and look at another push, but this time we're going to do it from Seven's combo perspective, I think. Oh, tick 53,000 is here. Okay, we're almost there anyway. So this is the fight that happens afterwards. Um, where you guys have lost three people like almost instantly after taking second point oops <laughs> not great it's a good thing i was trying to cut through these ticks so people didn't have to see all of that stuff here's a question how to tell when a mid fight has gone badly so you can keep more people alive the usual indicators that a mid fight has gone badly is either that your entire team is dead or the majority of your team is dead <laughs> Um, well, or you've been pushed off of your ground to the point where you're not going to be able to recover it. I mean, and when I say your entire team's dead, I mean you've got enough players down to the point that you're not going to be able to realistically contest the other team, and you'd rather just keep your medic alive. I mean, if you remember earlier, players. we saw it with um, when we looked at one of the first mids, the second mid, where um, Elicor killed Flash right at the start of the mid. We could go back to that if you really wanted, um, but you saw how Seven retreated instantly. Like, as soon as they lost Flash, um, Kedus dropped off the point, and they had no position on the mid, and they were one guy down. So they lost their first guy instantly. They just chose to retreat at that point. They could have continued the fight, but they would have been at a disadvantage, and they were more likely to lose at that point than to win because of the number advantage that the Scent have on that mid. So that's a good example of probably what you're asking is... Um, like when you know when to leave, Seven knew, didn't decided not to stay in when they lost a guy instantly. Um, if you lose a guy instantly and there's no damage done to work off from your team, like it's a good idea to leave and just focus on defending the next point, which is what um, Seven did. Yeah, basically, so Seven didn't want to fight with one man disadvantage. I mean, they could have fought it and they could have won it if they um, hit all their shots, but that's just gambling on um, your DM working, uh, which isn't a smart way to play the game. Sometimes it works, but if you play percentages, you'd probably think nine or eight times out of 10, they would lose a fight mid from that position and they play percentages. So yeah, 
that's to answer your question. Uh, but yeah, we're going to go into this next fight. Uh, snap off it is more about positioning. Uh, yes, yeah, in a way it was about positioning. Um, Elicor and Ascent had all the position on that mid, and Seven had none either. So they lost a player and they had no position on mid, so they left instantly. That's another way you, you can tell you can leave as well. Even if it's 6v6, as if your team has no position, like you're stuck. I can't really think of any good examples to show you in this game. But if your team's got no position and you're kind of stuck, like on the floor, and they've got the high ground, or your team's taken a lot of damage and nobody's been aggressive, and all of them are looking at you, um, or you're like stuck on your side of mid and surrounded, you know, or they've got players behind you, and you've got, and you have, you've got players chasing the people behind you you know it's like in a real war you know if you get flanked outflanked you just got to move back and retreat times like that as well that happens how do you decide to stay on your own side of mid or take the enemy's side on mid um it's very subjective yeah it's all about your strategy really um it's probably this is not a good example to show you uh I mean, you've got to remember there's more than one map. We're just focusing on Gullywash. Um, there's more than one map in TF2 as well. But it's kind of hard. I'd say probably you just decide it, depending on your strategy. Uh, more than anything else. On this map specifically, teams can go up on the right and take their side of the mid. Um But generally, teams will do their default um, because you can deny that that mid quite easily if your demo man's on point and your scouts are on point to deny soldiers. It's harder, it's kind of harder to explain. I mean, I could we could talk through it, I guess, in a in a bit. Actually, let's skip this uh, next next demo um, bit and just move on to the to the last bit of stalemates. Um, now I know what you're thinking stalemates. They're going to take a long time. Just to explain what a stalemate is. A stalemate is um, when you reach a position where uh, it's hard to push. You'd see normally it's equal Ubers. Um, so both teams will have 100% Uber and both teams will have the same numbers. And one team will own either a midpoint or fourth point, and the other team will be defending their second or their last. And the team that's defending second or last will have no incentive to push because it's harder for them to push middle than it is for them to hold hold second. Whilst it, so they have no incentive to push unless they're losing the game and the time's running out. Whilst the team that's uh, attacking have the onus to push because the because they know that they have the advantage and it's their job to to break the stalemate. It's like I'm kind of explaining it badly, but let's just go on to a stalemate. Tick 59,000. What you find in TF2 is stalemates are very much part of the game. But what you see is there are different strategies and ways to break the stalemate. So as you can see in this example, um, tick 59,000 funds if you haven't been there, um, this yeah, example, yeah. Ascent own the middle point and Seven are defending the second point. Now also Ascent are 2-0 down, but there's plenty of time left in the game, so it's not necessarily the time factor. Um, it's like being, you know, you're 2-0 down in football and there's like, uh, you know, there's like only, there's like 65 minutes left like did it, like sitting back and defending at this point f seven is probably not a good idea. But it's, but Ascent still have to push second point because if seven tried to push middle point, it would be so hard for them because Ascent will have all the position. They will have a better Uber because Ascent seven will have to Uber early. Ascent will have a respawn advantage, so their players will respawn quicker if they're killed than Seven. If there's a fight on mid, and if Seven lose, they will lose second point and be on their last. 
which um, if you look at it from the other so it's for seven it's there's no incentive for them to push unless they have an advantage um, which is why it's on ascent to push and ascent know this if the situation was reversed ascent would be doing exactly the same thing so it's the onus is on ascent to push and break the stalemate and there's a couple of different strategies you can do um, to break the stalemate on this one occasion funds you your team elects to use credo on sniper um, which is one of the off classes we were talking about earlier and he's looking to get a kill or a pick to give your team an advantage to push you notice ams by the way it says ascent funds but this is ams is on spy he's checking for sniper so seven will know about this sniper from credo before he even takes a shot uh, so let's uh let's unpause it and see how it plays out from the point of view of credo three two one go but if you have any questions about what, how i explained it let me know like i don't know if i made sense or not you know notice arms has gone sniper by the way as well to counter credo but we're going to look at credo because he's the guy that has to make something happen so he's going big dog. In fact, you, you, you snipe sometimes, Funz. You talk through what he's trying to do here. Well, he's just looking for someone to peek that he can kill on. He knows that they've got a sniper as well, so I suppose his primary mindset right now is trying to win that 1v1. Uh, to see if he can get an opening. So he's is looking back at Choke every now and then, but it's not too easy of an angle it's to but, get kills. Yeah, from. knowing the angle is important. Yeah. Like, Ams knew about going there. On the top was smart because Credu wasn't expecting him to be there, but he body shot Credu. But luckily, Credu was buffed, so he stayed alive. This is the magic of the stalemate. It's basically down to Ams or Credu to whip something out here, which I think does happen eventually. But for now, uh, let's just, just pause it in yeah. three, two, one. Pause. Um, somebody just asked a question: um, How do you counter a very good sniper? Now, as you can see, this stalemate. Um, you've know, got to notice that Credu is not going in too deep. So he's staying on his side of mid. Now the reason he's not doing that, um, oh man, I wish I could go to a free view, but if, if I just click to the seven players' positions um, and show you, there's Ams fighting him. His first one, he's got to contend with um, Ams sniping as well. So you've got to contend with that. But if you look at Drac, this is Drac on Big Door here in this lower area. He's defending this flank here. Um, Drac is going to stop anyone, more specifically Credu, if he goes for it. I mean, technically, they could rush Drac here with buff players if they wanted to and kill him, which might happen. But Drac's job is to hold this door. And um, this is the holding big door meme, if you want to put it in Twitch chat. His job is to hold here and prevent people from flanking this, this area. So Credu can't get through here and go behind them as Sniper. Um, he's also spamming to make life harder as well. And if Credu walks forward into um, this area, you can't see it on the stream, but Cadus is basically guarding this this bit here, uh, the big door. So Cadus is going to spam that and stop Credu from walking anywhere near where he can get an angle to shoot anybody on his team. Um, and you can see uh, on this side, Flash and Captain are both at the choke, denying this. So there's absolutely no way Credu can get in close enough to snipe Raymond or anybody um, without being spammed to death uh, because of the way Seven are positioned defensively. Um, and Raymond's sort of sitting in the middle somewhere safe. And he trusts his team to defend here. Um, so generally that's Credo's a really good sniper as we'll see in some of these clips, by the way. Um but he can't do anything if people are doing their jobs defending the point correctly. And that's what Seven are doing. So to answer your question, how to counter a good sniper, defend your zones, spam choke points. Uh don't peek too much. Um, run a counter sniper as well. Uh I hope that answers your question. Play CP Orange for 12 hours a day. That helps as well. But yeah, we'll go back to uh, we'll go back to this fight with Credo. I'm gonna unpause in three, two, 
one. See, he's still fighting the Ams. There's Drax spamming the big door as I talked about. Go on, funds. Keep talking. Let's give some commentary. I mean, there's not too much to comment. I'm pretty sure it's just going to be similar things. Credo is rotating to choke right now, though. I suppose he's going to try his luck actually standing by choke to see if he can pick off one of the combo members. But it doesn't look like they're quite peaking yet. I'm not sure where Ams is at. But uh, if I go into third person, we've still got Chris on big door, so he's going to be watching the flank, which gives Credo some sort of free reign to just go from here, but I'm not expecting much to happen because snipers don't usually get picks from choke. Spotted those stickies. They, unless they just surf in and drop the mag. But, oh, he's now looking at Ams and he actually does manage to get... Also, on Chris so has killed that Drak. A, yeah, and Chris has gone behind and killed Drak. So that's quite nice from us, again. Not let's, me, let's look at what Seven do, fight. though, um, in response to this. Let's just pause now. Sorry. Yep. Um, yeah, I did. So this is oh, I've got this bug <laughs> uh, where I'm just scoped in. Oh, look at there's a uh, look at this. I you to <laughs> no, I'm not. This is actually pretty funny on the stream if you watch. I could just look around. Oh, look at this. It's like I'm looking for a periscope or a telescope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> nice this demo system is awesome. Um, yeah, we're gonna watch. Um, we're gonna watch seven responses because seven just lost two people um so it looks like cadus is going to take an U uber uh so i'm going to unpause it in three two one now watch it from raymond's point of view uh flash kills chris behind you notice um they're still going to fight this even though they were player down because they got respawns coming in and you kind of get baited by your team a little bit there. Ooh, I, re I remember that. I did feel particularly baited at this point. Yeah. And then Seven, actually, let's pause now though. Seven are actually able to win that fight. Um, now what Cadus did was um, what's called a solo Uber, where he Ubers, Raymond Ubered just him. And the idea of that was to try and force Ombrak to Uber more than one player, which would give his t him a longer Uber, or a slightly longer Uber, which would enable stop a scent from flooding in with their uber and it kind of worked and also flash killed chris behind which gave um and because ams and Dra um, captains were respawning it gave uh, a seven the numbers advantage which uh probably is probably why on didn't commit there but unfortunately funds didn't get the message or a bit of breakdown in communication i think i believe there was some uh, hesitant calls to push in and then by the time it had been engaged people decided they didn't want to anymore that's a polite way of putting it yeah, I just like that... idiots. <laughs> yeah you uh seven played that situation well but um it was uh so seven have now got an opportunity to break the stalemate and capture middle but let's see if they do it let's watch credo again he's still alive remember after getting that arms kill so let's unpause again in three Two, one. Oh my god. Great shot on Flash. Oh! Wow. So, <laughs> that doesn't happen much in, in games. <laughs> yeah, it's just typical credit, really. But those two shots were absolutely ridiculous and have now seven have to retreat. They've lost both their scouts. That completely turned the fight on his head. Um, I spent the entire time talking about positioning and, you know, uber advantages, but that's an example of how skill can win you fights. Like, by all measures, Seven should have lost, won that fight, but Credit just hit two ridiculous shots on Flash and uh, yeah. Ams and won that's you guys that fight. That's the kind of shot that Credit always pre-calls. He's like, yeah, I'm going to hit this shot. And here's the amazing 5% ad uber push that we pulled off. So Let's see how it all weaves together. So yeah, that was uh, that was all down to pure skill. That I wish yep. um, if if uh, well, 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 yeah, yeah, that, that was that's pretty much it. The stalemate is now over. And then you guys win the round based off that. It was a weird one to break the stalemate. You need use the sniper to do it, and then Chris made a play on the flank, then caught Drac out, um, which I think I talked about. You just take a buff and you just go kill him, in Big Door. He's alone there. Um, yep. 
and they gave you the advantage, but Seven played out well um, to get control of the fight again and then push mid. And they would have gotten mid 100% if um, Credio just didn't hit two insane shots. And that turned around on its head and allowed you guys to win when you were about to start losing. Sometimes you need skill. Uh, again, getting kind of late here. Gonna just go through one more stalemate. Um, this time we're gonna see some different tactics from you guys to break the stalemate. Um, um, we can talk about the concept of sacking, all exciting stuff. Yeah. So you're gonna go to tick eighty six thousand. Make sure you get questions ready because this is the time to get them. Is that eighty six thousand? Yeah, this is the last clip we're gonna watch. I'm sure you're all bored of listening to my voice now. There's actually a few questions that I can see in chat, which I will bear in mind after we look at this. I see you, Don Basak. Oh yeah, Twiku just mentions Sack is short for Sacrifice, um, which will be self-explanatory. The idea of a sacrifice is that one of your players, typically a Roma or a Scout, will sacrifice their life in order to gain an advantage, um, which will break the stalemate. Uh, we've seen Credit Sniper, and he's still on Sniper actually um, during this, but it's not the only thing your team does. You do do some sacks. You know, I don't think I ever knew that sacks stood for sack. I'm pretty sure I never knew that. Yeah, I thought they now stood for, for sack, as in a potato sack. Yeah, yeah, that's how I always picture it. When someone says sack, I always just associated it with like chucking a giant potato sack at someone. <laughs> I never even realized it stands for sacrifice. Okay. This is what um, modern day education is like in this country, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But you're gonna you only learn one language. Okay, I'm here anyway. I'm pausing. Three, two, one. Now Credo is still on sniper, but I'm gonna watch watch Chris do some sacrificing. Now seven are holding last. They've got the sniper. They've got an engineer. So they've got a defensive setup here. Um. I'll just talk through, like Chris wants a buff here. He's trying to go top left. He gets spammed originally, but he still goes um, here and jumps. Now he could have killed Raymond there. A uh, combination of nice movement from Raymond and um, some beefed rockets from Christopher. Denied him that. Sack. I can see you just killed Ams there. Ams was doing, okay, let's just pause uh, three, two, one. Ams was doing what was called a counter sack, just to explain them. Sounds pretty self-explanatory, really. Because Chris sacrificed himself, um, if Ams goes and dies instantly, he has nothing to lose because your team is not going to push 5v6 um, or 5v5 with Uber. So if he just instantly pushes in and he just goes for something, you know, probably I'd probably say like, 19 times out of 20 he'll fail but if he just instantly does it he has nothing to lose so he's just going to run in and try and do something like that wasn't a mistake by ams um he just ran into a position where you had the advantage and you killed him it's uh, that's called counter sack and as you can see on the spawn time he probably did it a little bit late because now chris is almost respawned but by the time chris is back in the fight ams will spawn in like five seconds and his death is completely meaningless because if they sent Uber right now, which they won't, but if they did, Ams would be alive by the time the Uber ends, and Seven would still have an advantage. So uh, if anyone didn't know what a uh, sacrifice uh, counter sack is, that's how it works. If you don't understand, please, uh, we'll try and explain it better. But yeah, I'm gonna unpause it again in three, two, one. Gonna watch Chris's pov again. No, actually, I watched this um, when I was reviewing this um, before. I actually think Seven could have prevented this a little better than they did. Uh, in fact, let's just pause it again. Sorry, we're going to go to Seven's point of view. Just pause it now. We're going to look at um, Seven. Uh, I'll just look at, I don't know, Captain. I didn't look at Captain much. He's trying to deny this area where he jumped from. Uh, let's unpause it in three, two, one. 
So he's going to try and deny this area where he pours from. Jumps from again, but you notice how he doesn't. Like he's at the exact same time, he gets he goes for Chris. He was making no, sorry, sorry. He drops off at the exact same time to look at River, and Chris jumps in. Uh, if it wasn't for Am's body shotting, Chris in mid air, he might have got the force there. I don't know if you guys saw that. Um, but that was actually close. You could see as a reaction, Falash has put the gun up on here to deny that jump now. Uh, it's quite interesting, small meta game plays. Because Seven, um, because Captain stopped watching his entrance, it allowed Chris to make the jump. And if it wasn't for F Am's body shotting him in the air and stopping all his momentum, he could have got the force on Raymond. And as a reaction, Falash has moved the sentry gun on the top left to prevent Chris from doing that again. But what that does do is open up him being spammed. Inter interesting small stuff in the game. Uh, any comment on that, fans? I've paused it, by the way, if you didn't know already. <laughs> Nothing to add, really. Well, that's good. Um, <laughs> those those sacks could have easily worked for Chris if he had aimed a little better on the first one, and then the second one, if Ams hadn't hit that body shot, Chris could have easily got it. So it's like a luckily for Seven they didn't get punished there. Um, Captain made a few mistakes in his positioning, but Raymond's dodging was good enough. So they, they survived that. Let's uh, watch it from Credit's point of view. He's still on Sniper. And pause again in three, two, one. He's uh, on main here. You want you want to talk about talk about what he's why he goes main? Which which uh, team are you at right now? Oh, sorry. Let's. Uh, I think I got lost. Yikes! Everyone just saw that. <laughs> I could tell you why he went main because he last showed himself on Riverside and Ams was looking at Riverside, so that's how he got the kill. But what tick are you anyway? Yeah? Ninety-three thousand six hundred and sixty-eight. Right. Give me a sec. You can talk for now. He, you wouldn't have seen this before on the stream, but the reason he got Ams his kill there is because he rotated his position. Now, when he last showed himself to the seven, seven he was on Riverside. So Ams was looking at Riverside, assuming he would go there, and he went main instead and got a perfect angle to snipe Ams. Um, so that's it's uh, something a sniper where it's important to rotate your position. Otherwise, you become too predictable. It's a perfect example of how it works. Are you ready, Jay? I'm ready. I'm okay. Uh, gonna unpause in three, two, one. So yeah, good kill by uh, Credu. You see, he's rotating again. Oh, oh, Fun's just died going for the sentry. I'm sure you can tell us what that was about. I think I go for a little sack, but get knocked. I like tried to hide behind the pillar so the sentry wouldn't get me, but then I get splashed away from it and get killed by the guy. Yeah, this time Credu's denied um, in lower. He does the same thing. He shows himself on the river. Drac sees him. Then he goes back to main, but this time Drac knows he's going to go back to main. So he Drac rotates and kills him. Uh... So yeah, trying to break the stalemate, still ascent, you're free one down. Notice how Credu's sitting and spawn as Pyro right now. I guess you're talking through your strat. Um, but he actually decides to go uh, Sniper again. So again, we're just seeing the Sniper is, is Ascent's weapon of choice to deny the stalemate. Let's see how it works out. Go on, fans. What's he trying to do here? Uh, let's see. Well, he's just, again, going for picks, you know? It is it is the common thing we do in stalemates. Like, Credo is obviously a good sniper, so you will see a lot of him slipping. Now he's going for the amazing, uh... The headset yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> hero shot. When you see a sniper in big store, he's usually... I'm not big, but in the river, in that area, he's usually gonna go for the hero shot. But yeah, in that case, he actually does pull it off. And I'm hoping we win this next push. <laughs> and it's sort of down to me and other call to do that. 
So we take care of the gun, and I'm just standing on the point, and it looks like I'm capping it. So yeah. Again, Kudu with some amazing shot, just winning us the game. Yeah, basically so, yeah. the two rounds you've won have been. I was just pause it again, I guess. Actually, I'm just gonna watch it out from here. Nothing else to really talk about. Um, the two rounds you've won have been on the back of great sniping from Kredu. Um You did a good Uber advantage push on the first round as well. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. If we're not going to win enough mids to justify just pushing with advantages we already have, then we're going to need some good solo plays from people like Kredu. Yikes. I was just watching Eskimo's bomb there. That did not go well. Yeah, and now we're getting fucked. Fudged. So fudged. fudged. Now we're getting fudged. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. Seven have won like, uh, most of the mids, thing. like with that strategy you were talking about earlier. I've noticed that in this game. Yeah, and now you're on last defending again. Uh, it's pretty much coming to the end of the stream. Uh, we've been going for like two hours, so get re ask some questions. Uh, we'll answer them. We'll just hop in a server or something. Hopefully. Two hours? Yep. Oh, wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Time flies when I get to spend time with my favourite ex-teammate. Who unfortunately isn't here, so it's you. This is exactly... Oh, this is, we watched this push already. This is the one that Elicor kills Drac with... Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've got this entire game just memorised now. I think you probably learn a few things about how your team can improve. Yeah. You can thank me. Better. You can thank me if you beat seven next week. At the end of the day, it's just a very drawn out demo review. So. There we go. Re oh yeah. Review your demos if you want to improve. That's the. I mean, the key. the good thing about reviewing your demo is, it doesn't matter what level of TFT you play. If you review your demo, you can improve, and learn stuff. It doesn't matter if you're a new player, or you're in a, you've been playing the game for ten years. Like me, reviewing your demo is always good. Do we have any questions, funds? Uh, not recently. I've seen there were some. Just there's a lot of questions generally about last last pushes, but we've been over quite a lot of that stuff. And the kind of thing you need to look out for. Nah, well, I'll just we're gonna watch the game. You see, uh, Kato skills your combo. With a slightly better Uber, you guys tried to push into second. Yeah, the Uber just came off me and I wasn't able to get out, so I tried to run over the fuse without a flash. In oh, me. one of the things they just oh. did there, Seven, is they did what's called stacking the point. Um, I'm not going to go back and show you guys, but basically the premise behind that is you all jump on the point at the same time to make it cap as quick as possible, and that's to stop the enemy team from forward spawning here um, which pushes them back to spawn back here which obviously makes it easier for you to capture the next point because the enemy team have less players on there immediately um, and also reduces the chance that they'll hide someone in forward spawn to and kill your medic or force your uber so that's something uh, you can all learn to do as a team there's an uber advantage push i think this could be one we saw same thing. Cadus takes position on top. Elicor's actually fighting him in spawn this time and kills him with like 2 HP, but dies to Falash. That's the heavy. The heavy is one of the big reasons you win this push. Everyone's ice skating around, by the way, on the demo. Good kills there, Jay. Chapman. Let's watch this. Uh, let's watch this fun Uber. Oh, where is he? There he is. It's amazing point capping action. I'm just going to watch the rest of this demo out as you guys ask questions, try and I answer them. Good, I do see a good question in chat, Go which for it. is important things to say over comms and what is commonly said in comms that isn't actually necessary, like what clutters comms. So, um, I mean, one thing that clutters comms a lot is, I mean, there's a lot of things, but off the top of my head, one thing is useless damage calls. Obviously, damage is a good thing to call, but... A lot of the time, cluttering it with completely useless damage calls is just going to make your comms very complicated. So, like all general, these, it's... all these pistol shots you're doing right now on the yeah, stream. Yeah, like I'm, yeah, exactly. Like I'm not just going to be saying soldiers taken fifty, demos taken thirty. Like 
when there's no point in me calling it in that situation, for example. I mean, if you have a main caller, um, obviously most of the sort of game plan should be said by them. Obviously other people can be giving their inputs, but you don't want everyone to be sort of theory crafting what you want to be doing in the game at the same time, because it's yeah. not going to help anyone. There's things, something called counter calling, which is where you have... Um, you have a where teams don't have an, a, a set main caller now. Seven have Cadus as a main caller. Your team, I'm not 100 percent sure who it is. Is it Umbrak? Um, yeah, it's like Umbrak does a fair bit of calling, but then we don't really have a, a like specific main caller. But it's hmm. mainly like sort of Josh and Umbrak doing a lot of calls. Uh, uh, like and in Low Panda, we had the Ubers. And it was very important um, as a team, though, that you don't have something called counter calling. So when your main caller makes a call, I mean, you can briefly discuss it for a few seconds, I guess, during PCWs more than anything else. But um, if your caller makes a call and he wants to do it, it's important to not just be like, no, I'm not going to do that. Or no, yeah. no, let's not do that. Let's not push big door. Let's push choke. And even, and there's a big saying is even if the call. It, is is a wrong call by your main caller you should still listen to it because it's good to have the environment where you have a a set leader um who has authority because if you undermine your leader uh, it's going to affect how your, how your team works so if you and you're going to have people do different things which is not what you need when you want to compete at a higher level yeah uh, so that's why you, nobody will be counter calling Kalos on seven. But I'm not sure if people are going to counter call Umbrak. Um, I'd, I'd think Josh would call more than Umbrak would, because Josh is the alpha male of the team, isn't he? Yeah, Josh does do a lot of calling. I don't, honestly, I couldn't even say who does the most calling on my team. That's not Cause... a good sign. That probably explains why you're losing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, while Josh does the main calls, it's like everyone sort of gives their own inputs. A little bit, but yeah, the main two, as I said, is going to be Umbrak and Josh. Josh leading the pushes, particularly. I mean, you can, just to stop people from being confused, this is a nice stalemate, by the way, just to stop people being confused, uh, like, the main caller doesn't always have to call everything. Like, you can be calling stuff like, um, I'm watching Riverside, or I'm watching Point, because someone watch River. That's what I do a lot. As uh, your team attempted to push out here, you're losing 3 2 with five and a half minutes left, so it's not a surprise you're starting to take a few more risks. You can see Flash did what's called a sack, which we covered. He did a sacrifice. You guys have kind of got some turtley classes. Oh no, Flash got the medic. So you can see Credo isn't the only one that can snipe. Flash got a couple of hits there. Uh, this is looking very bad. This is kind of a grim situation, so I'm guessing you're doing a desperate play where you try and kill the flank. Yeah, at this point, you lose your med, you lose another player. You're going to have to pull out some magic if you want to pull an uber disadvantage push. Any, seven in that situation. any more questions? Uh, any way to win uber trades reliably? Well, obviously, there's no oh, specific way oh, because what? it's not exact. Let me just, sorry, let me just quickly uh, say something to you, Don Bassico, who asked about comms. I'll give you a rule of thumb with comms if you're never sure. Rule of thumbs with comms is uh, call the enemy combo position, call any big damage that you do, and uh, call any players that are an immediate threat to your team. Like, those are sort of like the three big, big rules of communications. So, call, call big damage what you're doing. Call any uh, the enemy combo and call any players that are an immediate threat to your team. Just follow those basic rules and your comms will be fine. Of course, there's more intricate top comms you can do as you evolve as a player, like teamwork comms. I'm pushing now, I'm sacking now, but those are the three basics. I hope that helps. Sorry, go back to that other question. Um, yeah, anyway, to win Uber Trade to Ibo. But as I was saying, it's not exactly like as digital as that it's sort of like there's a lot of situation based factors to it um 
in general, better teams are going to punish you if you try and go for uber trades. So they're not really looked on as the main sort of priority way to push. Because if you're going for an uber trade, then like 9 times out of 10, you're going to have to use the uber first because you're going through a choke point. Uh, which means that they're going to end up with a better uber, they're going to be able to solo people. But in general, some things you can do to try and have success with uber trades, if you find yourself uh, doing them, is to bait the other team into using the for you by taking aggression playing your health well. You can do uh, things such as sending your soldier behind after the uber. Like one common thing that uh, especially Seven does is they'll push through choke with an uber trade. And then have a soldier like Captain jump back into um, river behind your team, which will then put pressure on your flank on your combo, that kind of thing. So if you can get players in that don't put themselves in immediate danger, but provide some sort of distraction and flank play, then that's good. But yeah, I mean, uber trades aren't too reliable themselves most of the time, oh, unless no. unless you've already got advantages to base the uber trade off. Oh, that's the game. Their yeah, that's the game. We get back capped, and it's of course win limit five because it was an essential scout. Yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> um, if you've got any more questions, you've got like a couple of minutes to ask them because we're going to stop in a second. But that's uh, back capping as well. Isn't something we covered, but I'm not going to go into it too much. But the concept behind back capping is, um, as the enemy team pushes out, you you, you sneak behind them. Uh, and you capture the last point, usually undefended, or there's one guy on the point, and you can win him a 1v1. That's um, what a back cap is, if you did not know that. Uh, also, what is the best way to prevent back caps and that? Well, since you asked, we might as well go through it. Haha. <laughs> Haha. Um, oh, well, I'm going to get a server. I wonder if this server's... The server's probably down by now. Yeah, it's it's down. I can get one if you want. Yeah, if you don't mind getting the server quickly, we'll just I'll just show you like um a way it can be done on Gullywash to prevent backups. But generally, the way you want to be um looking is uh, to prevent it is there's two ways you can do it. The f the first way is you leave one player on last and trust him to win the fight. Uh, usually a Roma soldier, or if your team is an engineer alive still, you might just leave him on last. If I send you a message on Steam, is it going to come up on the stream? No, nah, but it, uh, no, it shouldn't anyway. Well, that's the password, so just join off me. I join. Otherwise, you'll have to show it on screen. And then credit is going to join and mess it up. That should go up in a couple of seconds. Oh, okay, I see. I'm trying to join already. But yeah, the that's that's the one way you can do it. The second way you can do it is you have players cover every entrance, and as they push out, you check every possible hiding spot um, that they can come from. So, um, we'll, we'll we'll use Gully as an example because we've been focused on Gully, but we can focus on other map. Talk about other maps as well. We saw. A, in the demo, we saw Elacor um, spot for Lash when his team pushed out of last. Is it up yet? Yeah, it is. I'm in it. Yikes. Okay, I got a bad password. Hang on. But yeah, um, I'm coming in now. But yeah, we saw that. I'll just show you quickly since we got we got time. Uh, as a demo man player, it oh. is midnight now. It is yeah, when you're def late. when you're defended last. Uh, as a demo man player, a good way to prevent a back cap is when your team pushes out. Is a lot of teams will push out Riverside. Is you sticky this door, which has disappeared because it's soap DM on a server. You sticky this door. You sticky this door. No, I can't change that. And that way, this is the most common spot people back cap from. That way, you prevent um, the enemy enemy team from back capping through there. And at the same time, 
your combo is pushing Riverside, this area here. It's called River. Um, because there used to be water on this map. <laughs> a long time ago. A long time ago. You'll be if you're confused about why that's called water, it's because in the earlier versions there used to be water on that section underneath the point. Your your combo is pushing from here. So they can cover anybody that comes through here. So what basically your demo man is holding this area. And he'll normally have a scout with him as well. And your combo's cold in that area. So it's, it can only be back at by a spy. And let, or if your demo man messes up, which can happen. More often than not in my case. Um, or if they have a player hiding as well. I'll just show you some common hiding spots on this map as well. well the most common um, you'll find is actually here, sneaky. Oh, sorry, underneath the point, water. Scouts will hide, or players will hide here to back up, or they'll, or they'll just stay in water, and nobody will check it, which is a really bad mistake if your team lets it happen. This is a less known spot. As a scout or a soldier, you can actually get up here, known as the Greg spot to some people, um, who played the game for as long as I have. You actually get up here, Unfortunately, thumbs can't steal it. <laughs> I don't know what hit my head on there. Sometimes maybe, maybe you should give it a go. Sometimes, uh, oh, I might have sort of. I mean, sure. I mean, I'm, my excuses. I'm lagging. There you go. I'm oh, still good at the game. Nice. I don't think I've ever gone like that before, actually. You can do it, scout. Maybe you'll sort of putting it into uh, your it game. Me out. Yeah, that's a nice excuse. Uh, also, people are looking to hide. Um, no, the, the not the Greg, the Greg spot, the Greg spot. There was a TF2 player, played like for probably like six, seven years ago. He quit now, called Greg, played for a team called Infused. He was very well known for backcapping as a scout. Um, it was a thing that he did a lot, and he did it on every point. Uh, this bit in sneaky sometimes this is rare but sometimes a player will just hide in sneaky when the fight is lost or last and hope people don't spot him very rare that happens more common spot you saw flash hide here and an elicor check it but they're like, standing on top of the edge there which you can do but i can't do because i'm bad oh it's, it's harder to do where's this left you know only the, the bit flash tried to back up um, oh, but yeah, it's easy to get there, let's go. It's very, very common for people to check it. Ha! Sorry. <laughs> um, and also people will hide in this lower bit. Um, sometimes it's not actually checked. I mean, a devil might come into lobby and sticky the door, but they might not expect someone to already be here. And then that person can go in here and back cap. Uh, and on Riverside, there's not really too many spots you can hide without being seen, to be honest. So nobody really, nobody will hide here without being spotted. Um, so yeah, that's those are generally like back cap spots. Uh, did you so did you show the funny spots on mid yet? Oh, where not people so can back cap. Uh, I mean, not so much for back caps, but. Oh yeah, I mean teams can back up as well, but they generally these days they go for frags. Uh, hiding in the bush is a good way to back up, or to hide and sneak up on a player. Um, because it's actually unless you specifically check it, people can just like walk by the bush and not notice a guy hiding inside it very easily. Um, also this bit corner house elbow, people will hide in here as you push in, or underneath the point, like. There's moments where you can hide underneath the point, drop down as well, hide in the drop down. These bits usually get checked, but they don't get checked first. Pe most people are focusing on entering the point, and um, they're focusing on looking at where the enemy combo is and denying entrances. So the people whose job it is to check these spots, there's also, I don't know if you can get up there anymore as a soldier. They used to be able to, used to be able to get up there. I think it might be banned in ETF 2L, but it won't be banned in the Essentials Cup, as far as I know. Oh yeah, and there's some spots like that. Um, Almost. On top of the lamp. Um, see soldiers there, and uh, I've I think this is banned, but I've seen people like do this for <laughs> as a soldier as well. 
Uh, there's also, I think this is banned as well now. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get, get up there. Oh, here we go. <laughs> oh yeah, that's pretty good. You used to be able to get like way up there as well, but you can't anymore. Earlier versions of the map. Yeah. Or was it like way up there? I can't remember. Can't yeah. remember really. Yeah, somebody said people hide in the lockers by the shutters as well. Yeah, sometimes as well. You'll see people there. It's true. Uh, yeah, going through some hiding spots is a bit random, but... Yeah, not many people hide as much as they used to, like when Greg was around, for example, but it's really important to check these spots anyway, second nature. Um, there's a spot in Big Door. I remember um, Drac hit against me in the, when he murked for Lego. He hit above this door uh, as we were pushing middle, and I spotted his feet bike there. And I just, I just like, uh, I think I called it for you to shoot him and kill him. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. yeah if, uh, any more questions, or shall we wrap it up? I heard you can actually levitate anywhere on the skybox. I have no idea. You can't, you can't levitate anywhere on the skybox, but you might be thinking of wall bugs, which is to do with walls that are not angled with the map, but there is. A lot of. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I think. You can hide here as well. Getting banned. <laughs> hiding. Yeah. I'm not lucky. Wait, let me see how if, oh, see yeah. how effective that is. Funds isn't even where I am. <laughs> There's a bit of delay. It's yeah, hard. A, I mean, that's a common sniper spot around. It's there. hard to get out of though, um, without rocket jumping. Yeah. The, the spot I was actually in on mid, you can't get out of. I'm pretty sure. You just get stuck in it like a pouch. But yeah. Yeah, well, that's we're going to wrap it up now. It's, it's pretty late, so... Uh, I hope um, people have learned some stuff. I know Funz has learned how to play Scout better after this demo review, but for any people, I hope you've learned some basics. No. Uh, and if you have any more questions, you can always... Keep asking them as the stream closes. Or tweet me if you want. You can tweet me. I have a Twitter. Hildreth1101. And you have a Twitter, don't you, too, Funz? Yeah, it's uh, at FunzGG. Thank you. Make cool. sure you follow me. And sub to me on Twitch. <laughs> yeah. None of that, please. Uh, and also, <laughs> please, thank, thank you, Essentials, for hosting us. We're happy to come in and um, share some advice and knowledge with newer players. Uh, Essentials are running a monthly cup that is free to enter for any skill level. Um, they hold European Cups at so the first weekend of every month. And NA Cups the second week of every month. And the sign-ups will be opening very, very soon. The NA the Essentials monthlies. Uh, with So stick around for them. And if you can't play, you can always watch on this stream as well. So yeah, hit that follow on Essentials. And yeah, thank you for watching. Thanks for pulling up with me and funds. Bye-bye. Yeah, it's, it's been great. Thank you. Bye-bye.